Uh, as we heard earlier, the UK is one of the world's leading producers of TV formats. We've been talking about film, gaming, drama, all sorts of things. We're going to talk a bit about TV now. In 2010, international sales of UK TV programs reached £1.4 billion. Pounds. Well, Sir Peter Bazalgette is responsible for more than his fair share of the formats and the sales. Uh, he was chief creative officer of Endemol and personally devised some hugely popular shows like Ready Steady Cook, Changing Rooms, Ground Force, and he also brought Big Brother to the UK. Well, Peter's now a media consultant and digital media investor, and we're going to hand over to him for the next 40 minutes for a discussion on the development of global TV formats, and before that, on the great British drama. So, Peter. Let me see. Oh. Well, it comes to the other end. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to spend the next two sessions talking about British television and looking at five British television hits. The last 10 years has been a really, really exciting time for British television because we've started to export to the world in in an exponential way. The exports of the British television product to the world have been growing incredibly fast. There's a simple reason for that, in my opinion, and that is that we have about seven or eight big, well-funded channels in the UK that have a huge appetite for original ideas. They pump a lot of money, they're very competitive, into original ideas which they want to get on air. And so that happens here. They, between them, invest about four to five billion dollars a year in original content. And then we also have a thriving independent production center, uh, sector. We've got more than 300 independent producers who are actively marketing their programs around the world. So we're going to look at five hits. In the first session, we're going to look at what we're calling the great British drama. And you know, one of the interesting things about British finished programs exported to the rest of the world is that in the last decade, the value of exported programs has quadrupled, and in the last two years alone, it's gone up by 50%. So we're going to look at two great drama hits today. The first is Sherlock, and the second is Downton Abbey. Between them, these two shows have garnered more Emmys than the Chinese Olympic team has got gold medals so far. Uh, they've had a fantastic reception around the world and been garlanded with awards. So first, can I ask you to welcome the team behind Sherlock, Sue Virtue and Stephen Moffat. Please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> and before I talk to them, let's see a clip of Sherlock. Do, come sit down, where have you been asked? Well, I don't How fresh? Just in. 67 natural causes. Used to work here. I knew him. He was nice. Fine. We'll start with the riding crop. You want me for a flatmate? You're the second person to say that to me today. Who's the first? The name's Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221B Baker Street. You wearing any pants? No. Okay. Irene Adler, professionally known as The Woman. This is how I want you to remember me. The woman who beat you. Oh, you're rather good. You're not so bad. Moriarty is playing with your mind too. Cut your Steve, what's going on? You're ordinary. You're on the side of the angels. Oh, I may be on the side of the angels, but don't think for one second that I am one of them. I'm really pleased they used a clip from the program which featured an extremely alluring dominatrix. It was, a ser it was an episode that made my eyes water. Stephen Moffat, <laughs> you've created the modern Sherlock. How do you update Sherlock and why did you decide to do that? Well, clearly we know how to appeal to the public you, school boy. You know we? how to appeal to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we updated Sherlock because in a strange way it was easy. <laughs> Oddly enough, um, it was when Mark and I were discussing it. The, the, the number, we, we were talking about how much we love Sherlock Holmes, we talked about how much we, we adored the old Sherlock Holmes films that were updated, the Basil Rathbone ones. And then we started thinking about 
how easy it would be to do it again, because uh, in the original stories, Dr. Watson is invalided home from a war in Afghanistan, and we've had the great kindness to restage that same hopeless conflict to invalid him home again. And, the, and we kept talking about this for, for so long that we began to get uh, sort of irritated at the idea that somebody else would obviously get in first. I mentioned that to, uh, to my wife, to Sue, uh, who more practically said, well, why don't you actually do it? And she made us sit down and, uh, and plan it. But in, in a way, it was because the fit was so perfect. And just give us two or three of the key aspects of the updated character, you know, like the use of text messages mm. in Vision. And the, well, the, the, the uh, original Sherlock Holmes, as you probably know, uh, didn't really like to talk to people. He liked to send them telegrams. We've reinvented the telegram with the text. Uh, Dr. Watson kept a journal, which of course are the stories. We, we sort of fell out of the habit of uh, keeping journals until the blog came along. It all, it just all fits so perfectly. It was eerie. Uh, the, the, the biggest, you know, the biggest, most difficult hurdle in a way to go over was we had to sit down and say they can't call each other Holmes and Watson. Otherwise, they'll sound like a couple of, uh, well, public school boys. Um, uh, so, so we had to, uh, call them, had to call each other Sherlock and John, which, which you know, it took about as a, a day of pacing up and down thinking, is this heresy? Very of radical. It is. Now, you've correctly identified that Sue here, sitting here, is your wife. Now, mm. I should explain, Stephen doesn't take his wife everywhere as a minder. She is also the producer of the series. Now, Sue, just tell us something about the success of the series. It's been a huge rating success in the UK. But how well has it sold abroad? It's, it's sold, um, I think, just about everywhere, I think, now. It's, um, and it's interesting to look at, for instance, there's quite a lot of um, fan sites. Shadowcology was a big fan site set up. Um, and Twitter feeds. And I think I was looking at the Twitter um, feed. And I think they have had uh, over 180 countries, I think, that actually go onto their website as well. So it, it's actually being shown and it's being dubbed and it's being subtitled. And, and why do you think, either of you, it appeals to such a large number of countries abroad? Well, it's already a huge brand in a way, isn't it? I mean, Sherlock Holmes, uh, and it's, this isn't an exaggeration, this is actually just true. It's the biggest hit in fiction. Since they invented the idea of fiction, this is the biggest hit there's ever been. There have been more Sherlock Holmes films than anything else. The, you know, the second contender is, is way behind. And if if I may be so bold and so presumptuous, I think we make a very good version of it. And I think by making it modern day, we move the character closer to the audience again. The original people who read the Strand magazine, for, for them, Sherlock Holmes is a contemporary character. He was close to the audience, but we moved him back. What's the most surprising place it's sold or surprising reaction you've had? I mean, online, you must have had fans from all around the world getting in touch. There's a, there's a, um, a hashtag, um, Believe in Sherlock campaign, which which we were nothing to do with, but we keep being sent. Uh, we have them from China, uh, I think Brazil, from Italy, and they stand there holding placards saying, "I believe in Sherlock." Yeah. And yes, Moriarty as well, Krakow. Um, I think there are some of them in the back row, actually, but you don't <laughs> you don't have to put your placards up yet, okay? My um, favourite was uh, on my 50th birthday. I got uh, a YouTube uh, thing was done for me, a lot of skinny Russian girls singing happy birthday to me in Sherlock costumes. I thought that was brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> and unexpected. You have the next series coming up in 2013. Can yes. you give us any idea, any new directions, any flavor of what will be in the new series? No. I mean, Thank you. That, that went really well. <laughs> that went really well. What a good interview another, this is turning out three. to be. There'll be another three. Yeah, there will be, there'll be three more, three big films. Uh, we know what we're doing. Uh, and we know that we're, uh, I, mean, I, I, I mean by that, not that we're competent, but we know which stories we're going to adapt, but we're, we're holding back on saying it just yet. Okay. But, so we've got a good plan. In Wales. We, do, we film a lot of it in Wales, okay. and just the London bits in London, which is great. Okay. Now, like the very best chat shows, we ask you to stay there. Mm. We will even ask you for a couple more contributions in a minute. But next, I'd like to introduce the team behind Downton Abbey, another huge worldwide hit for Britain. And the team behind that, Julian Fellows and Gareth Neen, will you welcome them to the stage, please? No, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Where did the Danton idea, where did it come from? Gareth, Julian? Uh, it, well, this is my telephone going. That's ah. a good sign, well, that, isn't it? That, that, you want to take that um, could be the answer to my shall question. Shall I just take it? No, I won't take it. Um, the idea. Julian, I, Julian, I just want to thank you for not taking it. No, no, that's thank good. Thank you very much. As people do in the cinema now. Um, the idea originally came from Gareth, and we had met for dinner uh, to sort of, we'd been trying to put together something, and you know that moment when you know it's not going to happen, and, it's just, and you think it's not going to fly, and so we met for dinner to kind of 
you know, drink it away. And, and he said, would you ever think of going back into Gosford Park territory for television? And uh, Gosford Park was a film I wrote uh, some years ago about a sort of shooting party in a country house. And, and we realized that because the whole subtext of Gosford Park, if, it, if I'm allowed to say that, uh, was that it was all coming to an end. If it was going to be a TV series, we had to go back a bit. So we went back 20 years from 1932 to 1912. And Julian's being very modest because he's an Oscar-winning screenwriter, for those of you who don't already know, and Gosford Park was an Oscar-winning right. script of his. So he's the writer. There's the producer, Gareth. How easy was this to sell after your agreeable dinner? It was remarkably easy, and, and um, it, it all went so swimmingly well. I, 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 I increasingly felt we would have a bit of a disaster on our hands because there is a sense that most creative endeavours should be very difficult births, and, and this wasn't. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the way that the, the UK network, which is ITV, embraced the idea initially, the speed that they commissioned it, um, the way that they came up with a very substantial amount of money to make the show, even in 2009, which was their worst year ever in terms of advertising revenue. Uh, so it came together very easily. But you can't make drama at roughly a million pounds an hour without co-production partners. Explain who the co-production partner is. Well, we, we have the advantage of having a, a big studio behind us which, which gives us cash to deficit finance the show. We can't make it for the UK license fee alone. Um, and then we, we've also partnered, um, as Sue and Stephen have as well, with, with uh, PBS in the US, who, while they don't pay a great deal for British content, they have been there for 30 years plus, 30 to 40 years, buying British content. I think what's interesting, though, is how both these shows and the, the, the way that they have traveled so effectively to the US uh, and, and around the world, but to the US where there are increasing other sources of co-production finance for British content. Julian, can you give me a flavor of the reception it's had in the States? Obviously, it's had 27 Emmy nominations, but uh, the audience reaction to it in the States? Well, it was very interesting. Actually, it's the first time we went out um, for the Emmys last year when we were all there together. Um, all our sort of people kept warning us. This, no, nobody's, the show hasn't reached enough people and they like it, but you must be prepared, you know. So we'd got all our sort of fixed grins on. Uh, you know, that look when you have to do good choice, you know, for someone else. <laughs> and, um, As I did for you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten. Um, so to my heart. But uh, in fact, we did win quite a lot. But it was, it was true that the the sort of larger audience wasn't tremendously aware of it. And then when we went back later that year for the Golden Globes, uh, it was completely different. And it was, you went into shops, and a bit, and everyone was aware of the show. And after that, it just kind of built and built, and then it became a sort of but what cult. But what is it, in your view, about the show that has proved a hit there? What do people like well, about I, it? I, I think that, again, there's a combination in both of these shows, and to Stephen's point earlier on, both of them are taking absolutely quintessential, in your case, the, the most famous literary character, in our case, probably the best-known British genre of all time. And in both cases, these shows have sort of reinvented those. We have a very, in ours, we have a very, very... Uh, well-known around the world British genre that's rolled out in Agatha Christie and all sorts of different iterations, the English country house. But the storytelling and the style of Julian's writing in the show and the, fit, the way we make the production is as contemporary and fast-paced uh, you know, as any modern show. Well, I think this is the same with Sherlock, actually, that what you, you sort of bring them in because they feel a kind of comfort element, but then you give them a completely different energy in the drama to what they were expecting. So it feels new, even though it has the comfort of, of something familiar. And I, I mean, I don't think the shows, are, uh, I think they both have that, actually. Um, but, I, but you know, really, you don't know. I mean, that's the other thing. Is people say, why is it so popular? And you pour out all this guff. But um, <laughs> the truth is, you don't really know. Julian, the thing about you is it's very, very high quality right, guff. <laughs> it's very high quality guff you get from Julian, so it's worth having. Uh, China, Gareth. Shows being shown in China? You yes, visited? I, I Tell was, me about that. Well, I was in Shanghai because we, we've sold it in China and um, they awarded us with the, uh, an award uh, in Shanghai at the festival there. And I, mean, it, I just thought it was remarkable that in the People's Republic of China, a show that is all about class, hierarchy, uh, deference, um, you know, in the People's Republic of China, I had people saying to me, this is their favorite show they, they've ever seen. And then, of course, I saw 
I hope we don't have the Chinese delegation here. God, I'm about to shoot myself in the foot. But once I started seeing the lines at the airport for the party delegates, I realized actually that the, the common theme of Downton Abbey and the fact that human beings will always organize themselves into hierarchical structures, that's proved true across the world. Everyone gets it. Everyone knows that we will have our status and pecking order within the world. Everyone can associate with it. Let me ask you all, but perhaps particularly Gareth and Sue, making high quality drama that sells to the world in the UK, why is the UK a good place to make that? What facilities, what skills, what range of craft skills have we got that helps with that? I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, far I, away, I think, far I away. Think start, I think we're allowed to get on and make the show that we want to make. So even though we have co-producers, we don't have to put in a German person, an American person or something. So I think it's all thorough. Um, I mean, certainly, as I said, we make a lot of ours down in, in Wales. And when we started, because Doctor Who's also made down there, there wasn't that body of people, but there are now. I mean, we've got, you know, sound people are Emmy-nominated, the art department's Emmy-nominated. I mean, it's really exciting, I think. Julian, you, you've, um, you know, you've produced and written uh, movies and drama, not just in the UK, but elsewhere. What, what, do you think this is a particularly propitious place to make good fiction? Um, well, I mean, yes, because I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and the fact is, we make very good drama. I do think one thing, actually, and that is period drama, of which uh, I don't work in exclusively, actually, contrary to what the papers say, but um, I do do a lot of period drama, and I think our actors have a kind of understanding of period. It's kind of, for, for Europeans, the past is in them, as well as the present. And I think they, they, they are at ease in that genre in a way that the Americans, for instance, I think find harder. I think Americans are wonderful film actors, wonderful film actors, best in the world. But they are a very contemporary race and they look forward all the time. And there is something about period drama where they tend to go into a strange place called period where people wear funny clothes. Whereas I don't think our actors do that. I think they make it very real. And that is, of course, you know, with something like we're doing, very, very helpful. I mean, the cast is, is so much one of, you know, the main reason for its success. Can I just ask all of you, are you now currently working on projects which we expect to come down the pipeline, those of which succeed in getting funded, which the world will see in the next two or three years. You know, is that your mindset, creating world hits? That seems rather tempting providence, doesn't it? I, I think, as Julian says, you don't know. I mean, well, and people, are, we, you only ever get interviewed when you've had a success. They should interview us when we've had failures. And we'll tell you exactly the same creative process went into it. So you don't know. You don't ever sit down and make a world hit. You sit down and make a, what you think will be a good show and that you think is great and then you get surprised because of success. They always talk about surprise hits. They never say what the alternative to a surprise hit is. We Has anyone ever had a predictable hit, <laughs> ever? We had a comedy which went to, to America and it was a huge flop, and we had the same interviews where they were saying, yeah. what do you think went wrong? We still had to keep making it up. Gareth, you know? <laughs> like every other sector of the, the creative industries, you know, the, the t television is, gl is global now. And I think that we do think beyond, you know, I, 10 years ago, we were really not thinking, you know, beyond these shores. And, and if you had an export, that was all to the good. Um, it wasn't part of the planning. But now there is a real sense here with both of these shows that the appetite to see the next episode in America or, or Australia or the Nordics or wherever it might be is every bit as strong as it is here. And I think everyone's aiming high most of the shows won't, won't get there. We screw up as many of them as, as they do in Hollywood. But there is a sense of, 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 a, you know, of, a, of, sh of shooting wide. Listen, you've come here. You are the authors and creators of two enormous world hits. Congratulations to you, and thank you very much for telling us a bit about the programmes. Thank you. Yeah. We'd like to thank you very much.